them like two months ago. Yeah.
friends this evening. So let's do some wonderful chanting. Aye, aye. <laughs> so this is actually a new melody. It came from yesterday spontaneously. So I hope it will come again. <laughs> I did practice it today. Um, oh, it's really hard for us sometimes, Pierre, when you come up with new things. I think this one is nice because it's easy. Okay, good, but also good. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be bringing some difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a familiar kind of sound, but. Okay. Yeah, you can see.
Fisher, you can well. You like Very it well. so much. <laughs> no, this, this song is a bit of a, I don't know, like it's a Native American feel to it, that kind of pentatonic mm. minor scale, that kind of that yearning, which these, I would say, maybe more feminine cultures have, like Native Americans and, um, I should not include upper about many of them, but the ones who live more off the land and simple and in the village. Um, and one thing that came to my mind was that, um, <coughs> like in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Arjuna is having this conversation with Krishna, and there's this gigantic battle is about to ensue, battle of Kurukshetra. It's a place you can go in India, it's northern India, um, it's in Rajasthan, is it in Uttar Pradesh? Anyway, up north. It's still there. And there's still um, nuclear fallout there, you know? And, you know, there's atomic bombs and stuff, then you get nuclear fallout. So it's still there <laughs> from 5,000 years ago that they had that stuff then already. Um, but it is actually the most defining moment like in this planet because at that time, there was still a one world culture. And this one world culture was still being maintained by elders and, um, and through that culture, people were actually able to receive from the elders. The elders were actually wise, <laughs> and, um, and the youngsters were respectful to the elders and were in a receiving mood. You know, humility is the vessel through which one receives. And um, <clears throat> so they understand, they have wisdom, we need it. And anyway, they deserve our respect regardless. So and that way, this, this, everything was maintained nicely. And um, a really God-centered lifestyle where everybody knew Life is nice, life, why should life not be nice? But the purpose of life is not to have a nice life. There's much more to it than just that. Nice, comfortable life is a waste of a life if it's not also um, pursuing spirituality. So, and they understood that. And it was a really nice balance, really healthy relationship with, I don't want to call it materialism, because materialism is more like the dedicated pursuit to that. But I would say, balance between the material desires, because they have it, and we have it, and what you do, it's there. Can't make like it's not there. It's very difficult just to put them away. If you can, then great, but I can't do that. I try, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, But otherwise, just come to terms with it, have a relationship with it, understand it. Certain desires should be dropped because they're not healthy. So one has to have knowledge of that, and the others can point that out. Because that's what this whole life of experience, where they see not just knowledge of the scriptures, but that actually that knowledge is fructified in the heart as realization by themselves applying it and also themselves taking shelter at, by an elder in passing that knowledge on. So it's a beautiful culture where there is knowledge, everybody receives it, everybody acknowledges it, but also everybody gets a chance to let it fructify in their heart. It's the difference between Gyan and Vigyan. Gyan means knowledge, Vigyan means it's, it's, it's awoken in the heart. You actually experience that knowledge. It's actually you validated it for yourself, for experience. So, um, but now there's this war that's happening, and what happened was the entire elderly, all the elders, they were all annihilated in this war. And it's actually one of the concerns that Arjuna raised. He said, if I fight this war, <laughs> the elders, everybody here is present, they're going to be killed. And what happens then is nobody's going to be there to pass on this knowledge to the men. And then what's going to happen is that the men are going to stop protecting the women. And then the women are going to get exploited. And when we're going to exploit it, you're going to have all kinds of unwanted progeny is going to be produced. So progeny is supposed to be produced in a very conscious manner. Where when one has a desire for begetting a child, one actually performs some purificatory rites. Because the state of consciousness that you have at the time of conception will attract the soul of a similar vibration. So if you just do it like an animal, which is how it works today, pretty much, in the, in the guise of love. Like, oops. <laughs> 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 well, but, no, that, uh, <laughs> exactly. Then, then you can attract 
beings with the animalistic kind of vibration. Beings who have no kind of sense of self-control, beings who haven't really the ability to have that, I and mean, everybody can learn it, but they kind of off to a bad start in that sense. And, um, and that's what's happening today, where we see people doing crazy stuff. And you're like, how did somebody do that? It's because it's called madness, actually. It's because it's called animalistic. The lower nature is completely dominating. There's no competition for the higher nature to to balance out the lower nature. So Arjuna was saying this is going to happen, and that's exactly what happened. He said, if I, this will happen, this will happen. And Krishna basically said, don't worry, I want you to fight. So this is actually a very big thing for many people in the Bhagavad Gita, that how can this super spiritual thing be spoken before this massacre, and how can Krishna is promoting warfare, what's that about? So um, the whole purpose of the Bhagavad Gita is about coming to the understanding that um, higher than beauty, higher than knowledge, higher than being pious or a good person is to be connected to the Supreme. That's the highest principle. And all other principles are actually supposed to facilitate that. So it's a very nice yardstick. But a little bit further, which is actually I want to talk about, Arjuna talks speaking about um, what about our ancestors? Because he's... Um, um, culture, his family culture was ancestor worship was there. They worshiped the pitas, is the Sanskrit word for the ancestor. Pita means father, but pita means the fathers, and pitri are the ancestors, and pitri loka, the planet of the ancestor. So they offer homage in, you know, in a certain manners at certain times of the year. They worship the ancestors because the ancestors, they are dependent on their descendants for that um, pinda, it's called because they actually get some nourishment from that, and from that they can also further themselves in that realm. But when that is, when that is um, stopped, these ancestors actually fall down from their position. So that's why it's considered that if one begets a, a very good son, this is actually considered the greatest wealth, because that son will continue the worship of the ancestors. And then when you leave your body and you go to that realm, you will be taken care of like that. And in that way, you're not only also getting sorted, but you're also taking care of your whole lineage by continuing the lineage and that culture. It's very beautiful. So Arjuna is saying, what's going to happen to that? What about the worship of the ancestors? And Krishna says, don't worry about that. Because just simply worship me. And one of the perspectives he's offering is that um, actually worship of the ancestors is important. But God, and Krishna, I know there's many different names one can approach him with. You can pick your favorite one. Unkulunkulu. <laughs> Allah, Jehovah, Yahweh, um, Elohim, um, they're very beautiful, all of them are beautiful, all of them are equally potent, they the same God that's been described. So if one simply worships God, then, then one is actually worshipping the oldest ancestor. So you're not giving up your ancestor worship, actually you perfected it, because you're going to the ancestor from which all the other ancestors have descended. There's a source from everything. So if you, if you worship that source, then you worship all the ancestors. So that's not being needed. And in that way, actually, you're glorifying your lineage because you're actually engaging that activity in a spiritual sense. Because if you just worship the ancestors, it kind of ends with your ancestors. Unless they themselves are very, very um, advanced, they can actually pass on that worship up through their lineage and that can go to God. So that can happen. And that actually happens in um, spiritual lineages when one is taken like initiation by a spiritual master who is connected to a bona fide disciplic lineage. And he, is, uh, he received this knowledge and power from, from his spiritual master and it's going like that and it also comes from God. And um, so then that passes on also. So then worshiping that personality um, the same effect is achieved. So, but if your ancestors can do that also, and every person in the line has that consciousness where they don't take, they just pass it on because they understand actually nothing is meant for me. I'm just a servant. Everything's actually meant for glorifying God. Then, then the same would be achieved. So, um, I don't know how we can look at our lineages and find out if, if that would work. So it stops there. So then it's, it's actually material activity. It's still very good. It's very pious. It's... Um, you're benefiting this life and the next, and you're benefiting others. But it's not spiritual in the sense of that activity, in and of itself, will not free you from the bondage of karma. 
and it runs free yeah. from your material desires, which are pulling the mind to all kinds of places where we don't yeah. even want to go. But if one worships God, the, the, the first ancestor, then that is achieved, yeah. and all your ancestors are honored at the same time. So, or you can yeah. honor your ancestors yeah. with this consciousness too, yeah. understanding yeah. actually yeah. there is the source, and then you approach yeah. your ancestors with that mood. Yeah. And in that way, they will actually they will yeah. offer their respects to you for approaching them with such a humble consciousness. Yeah. And in that way, they will also benefit. So what I'm trying to say is, is that um, um, I like to kind of, you know, each time try and approach it from a different perspective to see how, how that, at the end of the day, whatever one is trying to do, if you just approach God to do that, it's a perfection. It's the simplest, you guarantee guaranteed result, everybody benefits, and you get free. You get actual freedom. And today, I mean, this song kind of just inspired this kind of ancestral kind of feeling in me. So I think that's where that meditation came from. Is that you can approach like Krishna in that manner. And it's so beautiful. And even though after this battlefield of Kurukshetra, this whole thing was destroyed, but the essence has not been destroyed because it's there in the Bhagavad Gita for everybody to take. This age was supposed to start to fulfill the desires of the living entities to experience the world the way it is now. Basically, be in a society where you can do what you want and nobody can question you. So you can act like an animal and nobody can say, hey, why are you being like an animal? It's not politically correct. <laughs> we desire this, that's why we're here. That's what the world is now. It's like you can do anything and nobody can tell you nothing. It's, um, it's, uh, so, so this, this war facilitated that. So it says that, and I'll, and I'll end with this, that this age of Kali Yuga is actually the, the most terrible age because it's an ocean of faults. People are short-lived, we've got poor memory, we're not very beautiful, we're not very powerful, we bickering and fighting amongst each other all the time. I mean, father and son will kill each other for a penny. <laughs> it's like really chaotic. But at the same time, it's also the greatest age. Because in this age, simply by kirtan, by, by actually sang kirtan, by, by singing and dancing and glorifying God's unlimited names together in harmony, one can attain all perfection. So it's beautiful. So it's the worst of ages, but at the same time, it's the best of ages. Because we get to dance our way back to God. You don't have to sit in the forest and really, really difficult and almost impossible. Just putting all your desires putting it down and by your breath and just sitting like that for like God knows how long for years on end it's very very hard it's like you don't have to do it like that you can do it singing and dancing and you can do it um, in a way which suits your conditioned nature you don't have to ignore your conditioned nature you can engage so many I know the God your ancestors are kind of a thing so it's a, I mean not a thing it's, it's important to them so then yes Take that on, but add this consciousness and this approach in with it, and you'll perfect it, and you'll you'll see the effect in your life. So that's that's the also the message of the Bhagavad Gita is, don't don't change yourself, just add God in everything. That's it. Just remember Him in everything, regardless of you know the concept or one's understanding or knowledge or that doesn't need to be adjusted. It's God consciousness is not an artificial imposition on the mind. Um, just by one sincere desire to connect, God will connect back and He will assist us to come closer and closer and closer. Krishna says, Teshyam Satatyuptanam Bajitam Pritapurvakam Dadami Budhiyogam Tam Yenamam Upinantate. To those who constantly endeavor to serve me with love, I will give them the knowledge by which they can come to me. Somehow or other, God is not impotent. Like, no matter how useless we might be, that, that God doesn't have to depend on our condition to accomplish something. It's amazing. Can you think of that? It's like, <laughs> it's like oh, I, he can't help me because I know this. No, no, no. There's no such situation. There's, there's no impediment on the path of devotion. There can be no impediment on the path of devotion. Nothing can stop one from engaging in bhakti yoga, in devotional service, in connecting with love to God. And just that sincere desire, God will come in your heart somehow. You can reveal it within your meditation. Somebody will just come in the street and say something to you. Pamphlet will just blow in your face. 
and you read something completely unrelated to God, but some word or something might trigger a thought. There's so many ways that I can think, think of now in which it can happen. So it's really beautiful and personal and very intimate. So, um, and, and this chanting, I think, is, is the most powerful way of basically sticking your face in it as much as possible. And actually coming in intimate contact with, with um, thoughts. I think it's very beautiful. Practice makes perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just practice. <laughs> yeah, but luckily, we don't have to be perfect in a sense. Because yeah. we can just give what we are right now and just offer that, because that's all we have anyway. So you can't give more than what we have. And God's happy to take it. He will not. He doesn't like what we do. But practice is still nice because it's also like an expression of your endeavor. You're trying to improve yourself. You're, you're expiring for purity, but also some detachment should be there. Sometimes one gets attached to the idea of attaining purity, and that becomes a whole ego thing too. But, uh, but one should definitely go for purity, but also be detached. If you don't attain it, your attaining purity is not dependent on your awakening your love of God. And when you awaken your pure love of God in your heart, you will be pure without even trying to be pure, because that love itself is a purifying fire which will burn all impurities. It's our original consciousness. It's our original consciousness. It's not something you have to get, it just needs to be... <laughs> Stick it in some fire, you know? Sometimes, you know, God makes our life very hard so that we can be purified. I think we make our own lives very hard. Because if you fill yourself with resentment or shame or ego or... Mm -hmm hatred, then it's very hard to see God, you know, it's very hard to see the better things in life, because you fold yourself with so much. But that's also part of the path sometimes as well. That's really, a very nice point, you know. yeah. But when you start chanting the name of God, it opens up that crack of life for Him to come in again, you know, and it gets the wider and wider the more you practice. Like, exactly. Uh, yeah. Nice point, the well said. <laughs> Else, like, watering the root of the tree. Ah. We're talking about how we can uh, mechanically uh, render some prayers to the ancestors and forefathers, and that could be likened to watering the leaves of the tree individually, indirectly. Whereas if we simply go to the source, the root, we water the root of the tree, then all the leaves get fed as a byproduct anyway. If we go to the source and we worship the original source, Krishna, then as a byproduct all the other services or duties we may have to, to the ancestors or to the demigods or to, to the previous teachers, they all get fulfilled uh, as, a, as a byproduct of just directly approaching Krishna through the, the chanting of the names of Krishna, for example. It's like watering the root of the tree going to the source. And all the other duties are already Sure. Mm. That's a nice point. Yeah. It just reminds me of these six personalities. They call the um, they in our Gaudiya Vaishnava village five hundred years ago. They were called the six Goswamis. These six personalities who are absolutely phenomenal in their consciousness and just their individuality and what they contributed also in in knowledge and um, example. And um, this is one song that was described of them by or composed by one of the peers. And it says, um, Dhira Dhira Jana Priya Priya, which means that they were, I said this many times, it's a hundred thousand times a year. It means that they were favored by both the gentle and the rough because they were not envious of anyone. Or another way of saying it, everybody liked them because they liked everyone. They did not see ego. I mean, they saw the ego, but but they they connect to the soul. The ego is just a temporary condition, and that's not them. So, okay, that's not him. There he is. That's the soul. So what's there not to like? <laughs> so in that sense, they like everybody. So everybody likes them. Everybody offers their respect to these personalities. I'm like, wow. Can you imagine making something like that? Like, I wish I could. It's uh, it's incredible. But just also meditating on these prayers, one can connect to them also. They eternally exist in these, in these beings, super powerful. They don't require a body to be able to connect it. They, they're very powerful. And, um, and even Prabhupada once, he, um, 
after some interactions he had with people in the public, somebody asked him, he said, no, everybody likes you. The Prabhupada said, do you know why everybody likes me? He said, it's because I like everyone. <laughs> but like with humility, he said it. And it's that same point which came through. It's that no judgment, zero, just love. He understood the condition of the being and he thought, wow, if I can serve this person, just make one step closer to God, then I'll consider that success. So let me do my best, but it's not up to me. Either. That's just my duty to do that. And this person, I'm praying they will take advantage. But if they do or not, what can I do? I can just give them, offer them. So he's so detached, but this I'm so determined also to spread, you know, Krishna consciousness all around the world. So it's like a, such a keen balance. So it's like I, I aspire to become such a state of heart that I can see everybody like that. In, in, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Samasar Dashina, um, Sama Dashina. That then one sees an ant and an elephant and a man and a dog and a dog eater, and you see it exactly as the same. You don't see it different because you see the same spark is inside of it. The soul is there. What's the difference? The pure spirit soul. Other stuff is just details. For now, this is like this, they're conditioning, but in a few moments it will be different. That's God consciousness. Mm -hmm. Anybody else like to share a comment or <laughs> ask a question? I'd no, just like to say a comment. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful way that you have of explaining simple realities of, you know, life and how it works and how important it is to connect to your source and, and you've just got this most incredible way of explaining it. It's like very, very awesome. I'd love to listen to you and have a lot more. Maybe I'll come more and more often. <laughs> it's very kind of you to say. The, the truth is actually, it's um, this is actually the mercy of my spiritual master. That somehow or other, I've done something that he has imparted this quality to me. So it's actually not my own. Thank you for the encouragement. I love the, I love the connotation to source. Like, you know, it's like, you know, we all know the source. The source is the original, you know, heavenly father like me. Mm. A spark or whatever. Mm. But the way you explained it is like in, with your ancestors, you know, going back and back and back until you get to the original ancestor, mm. which is the source, mm. which is a very amazing way of exchanging it or visualizing it mm. or understanding it. Mm. Yeah. I'm guessing it's like a, a phase you, <coughs> you focus on Krishna and then. At some point, you start seeing Krishna in everything, mm -hmm. and then you can worship the ancestor, the tree, whatever. It's just Krishna. At some, at some point, you get to that stage when you're seeing Krishna everywhere. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the you know about in your readings or something like that? Because yeah, yeah. at some point, I guess the masters they're not. I guess they're singing a lot of time. But there's a point when they are just so in connection with Krishna that their heart is singing Krishna. Mm -hmm. They don't need to do an action; they just are in connection. I mean, that's obviously quite a way to go. But that's that kind of a place the masters attain or something, no? It's a fact. Yeah, and they're kind of in silence with that, yeah. with that connection, singing. And there's also different degrees of intensity that one experiences that. I guess the initial stages of, like, because at that stage, I think you're at pretty much at the stage of pure love for God. And then, and then you see that every person is just this overflowing of your love for God, which is just spilling into every single grain of energy you spend in this life, every single interaction. And then when that even develops more, you actually become completely mad. I've heard of like some saints that they no love phase. God. Short, short phase. <laughs> no, I think that just, that just, that, I don't think that ends. That's that the ends. That God. ends when the body just disintegrates or something. They, they become completely mad. They become so like, unaware of the world around them. And just every single thing just sparks this super intimate remembrance of God. Of some activity that God has performed or your spiritual memory is awakened at that time. You know, before we came to this world, we existed with Krishna. So those memories are reawakened, that you remember the things you used to do. 
just a few moments ago before you forgot. <laughs> and then then it's just like, you see something, it can be something like, I don't know, just like a bumblebee comes and sits and you see the bumblebee and you see the black and yellow stripes and it reminds you of Krishna's black body with his yellow dhoti and there you just go completely berserk for the next six hours. Crying tears, your body is shaking, people might think you've got epilepsy or, and you're just like completely not here. But just a little thing is triggered. It. Or something co somebody comes and just says something, you know. And then just like it triggers this and there you go again. And um, Mm. And I think the, the epitome, is that the right word? Of, of that was exhibited by this person called Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who, who appeared 550 years ago in West Bengal in Mayapur. And, um, and, and Ma, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is actually none other than, than Krishna himself, who came as a devotee of himself. Because he saw his topmost devotee, Radharani, and. Um, who was worshipping and serving him and she was experiencing this ecstasy, this topmost ecstasy. And he was looking at that and he's thinking, what is this bliss she's experiencing? I am the source of everything, but I'm not even experiencing this, I must know. So then he basically merged with her. Radha and Krishna are also one, they're actually not different. It's, it's, I, I don't actually understand anything more than that, that's all I know. But then he basically merged with her, he took her moon and he appeared as a devotee of Krishna. So Krishna came as a devotee of Krishna to experience devotion to God. So devotion to God is so attractive that even God himself has experienced it. And so then he exhibited this supermost, this, this beyond human ability, capabilities of expressing love of God. But if it's not the there's there's actually there's 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 duality and there's non duality simultaneously. Because if if in this realm is but no, but even in the spiritual realm, because if they're actually two opposing features which coexist, they're completely contradictory, but they actually coexist in an inconceivable manner. And the, word, the reason is, is because when one engages in that love, you engaging with another. Love is an expression to another. So love means this too, but in that expression, you become one. But as soon as there's no more two, there's no more exchange going on. No more love. So there's no more love. So there is two, so but at the same time, there's also one. one. So how that how our brain yeah. can't actually comprehend that? Yeah. But but this <laughs> paradox actually exists. So there is it is <laughs> but one. But even the Christian but at the same time, also two. I still remain me, yeah, and my love is still there. The and we have an exchange, but we're not separate. And you can, see that. And you can run around like this this logical yeah. kind of. <laughs> What connects us all? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It was all one thing, like God was in my heart, I wasn't God, but it was just the consciousness of God, the awareness and the love of God was filling me in everything, I could see it, everything around me, and the environment, the nature would respond to that. The birds were singing, going mad, they were like, someone's awake, someone's feeling the presence of God, and it's just, and in that state, there is no duality, because you don't know duality, you just know love, it's just pure love, and there's nothing else, there's no other, you just see love, and, you know, anyway. Yeah. That's true. Trying it's, to get back there. It's, it's beyond, beyond what words can describe. It's, it's something that one can only realize, actually. And the last thing that it happened, the people, people are, like you get madness, you can see when someone's mad. But when someone's mad and spiritual, you can see it. People have respect. Yeah. Like they're like, no, this is something, it's, 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 it overrides all laws and rules or anything else. So you can be happily mad and spirit and yeah. walk down the road in the, in the middle of a busy city and you're going to be... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it okay to about this? Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's a nice point. There's a very different quality to, to the lens. It's very clear. Yeah. In India, it's more accepted and it's understood. Yeah. It's part of the culture, the wandering, mystical person going from town to town. Yeah.
Okay. You know, offering yeah. Yeah. information so and, and knowledge, but also in a mood of bliss or ecstasy, which may appear, you know, transcendent. Mm. And they use the term avadut. And avadut is a Sanskrit term for someone who may be in an ecstatic state. Yeah, they're beyond social conventions and stuff. Walking yeah. yeah. in the street, <laughs> they're beyond all these things of what to do and what not to do. They just. Yeah. Yeah, I've been to the beyond. Like, beyond <laughs> you the can't general, tell them what to do. Oh, oh, so they can't tell them what to do. I heard a good buzz in my mouth. Respect. Yeah. 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 We're getting there. We'll hope we'll have that in our society soon. Eh? It's possible. We're going to start walking around. It's a day Yeah. It's a day Yeah, modern Western society doesn't really facilitate people living outside the paradigm of, of uh, work. Humorist, uh, that sort of works hard, yeah. So, so it's, not, it's not familiar with it, it's not available to us, and uh, the spiritual practices aren't there to, to invoke that either. And it's very much frowned upon, whereas in India the culture is much richer and spiritual practice, so it's more understood. Mm. Maybe people that live outside the general mainstream structure of society are also uh, respected and, and tolerated and, and, and facilitated. And also, it's quite Indian medicine, and uh, being in India, it's that very much when you come to India and you try to tell them a little story or a problem, that is, it's not yes or no, it's yes and no, and it's like, whatever, mate, go with the flow, you know. So it's that high, yeah, very good, very good. It's just like heart, India is pure heart, you know. And, it's, yes. and it teaches me not, yeah, it's yeah, grace. It's everything in perspective to the bigger plan and Krishna's arrangement. And it's all happening for a reason, and yeah. so there's a bigger picture. There's a you, comprehension and understanding of the bigger picture and how it's all interrelated, oh, and it fits in, and there's meaning behind it. Mm. Whereas we've alienated ourselves in the West traditionally from from the transcendent. Mm. Thank you. So Thank you. often we lose touch with meaning yeah. in, in things which are hard or difficult. You know, we don't we don't understand it. We don't see the meaning in it. We lose touch with the of soul. Whereas in India, that's it's more facilitated and understood. And yeah, on the spiritual journey on the spiritual path, you can reconnect with that and see the bigger picture. And see coming from one original cause, the source, mm. the causeless cause of all causes. Mm. Cause of all causes. Amazing. I love it. Uh, just like everything is there to see. Like in the, in the West, they, they hide all the kind of unpleasantries. The old people, the invalid people, the, re the retarded people. So this is nice and you're not knowing. <laughs> but in India, it's like everybody can contribute. If you're, if you're like lame and everything, they just put you on the mat down there with a little bowl. Just go forward if you're and you can And you, you can collect donations and lunchtime somebody comes and they tend to you. At the end of the day, somebody collects you and you contribute to your family. So everybody contributes. And so it's quite something seeing a person like that. It's like, it's really like, oral I don't feel like sitting out and he's like, he's not like compartmentalist. Mm. And seeing that, it's kind of run the game, shock. Right? Like, oh. <laughs> like, go big, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Make me some money. <laughs> you got an urn in your... You know what? just keep going, man. Would anybody like some cuddles? Free, free hobos around you. <laughs> 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 I, I think it's always a hobo. Would anybody else like some cuddles? Oh my god. <laughs> 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 Just give the rice. be really straightforward. You might as well just make brand noise. Oh, good to the point. Yes, no. There's stories there. This last week I've been going to this near death. Experience interview. They're all amazing. They're always beautiful. Yeah, watching them. Yeah, these interviews with people that are experienced. Speaking something. It's amazing because they all have, they might have different ways of getting there and coming out after, but they all experience the same thing of this like huge, powerful love that just pulls them up. And, you know, and then like kind of send them back to this message like, go spread the love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the subject comes from our garden. Tomatoes <coughs> and something from the garden. Yeah. 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 Ye
Getting more than my practice is such a great opportunity to practice. Yeah. Yeah. Your daily thing is hard. It's hard yeah. to keep it daily. Especially alone. It's much nicer with people. Yeah. Your own is as hard, eh? Yes. With a couple, if they're both devoted, then they're like, your own. So why not come monthly uh, uh, like every week? You know, so, uh, sharing your food and, and I mean, getting the instruments, not only practicing, jamming and. Yeah, yeah. I think in Buddhism they say the three jewels are Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Sangha being community. Like they, 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 they need to be able to share, share your discoveries or your, you know, your love or whatever. So it's a good Krishna presence tonight. Really strong. I'm guessing the more you connect with the spirit, it's always going to be. You think it's like there's more spirit presence, but it's just you are more present. And you're seeing it that's already here. Thank you. We're going to. It's so interesting the drumming and singing and drumming is just about a whole other level. It's like as soon as I start singing, I'm like, I gotta wait, and then he sings, and then I'll drum again. It's like, stop. So she brings your body into it as well. Because, you know, so your body is also part of us. It's so cute. 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 But it's hard, I always find it's, it's, it's difficult to sink and jump through. It's still, it's still like a... Yeah, no, it's very like it a... Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's why I like to more present because it's actually difficult. Yeah. I like this playing something. Something that's easy, you'll kind of just talk. Get your physical the rhythm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
or do you see it as like the earth, like a other place, and it's a place for lessons, or do you believe that there was, this was a high vibrational place before the fall? Is that in the scriptures? Well, it says that. Not at all. Who thinks of one? Hey, brother. Hey, Craig. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the music. Um, you're actually everything is spiritual because in the spiritual world it's, this is everything is spiritual and there's this little corner somewhere that's covered with the cloud of Maya and everything underneath that feels a little bit different and it's called material energy just by distinction but it's all actually spiritual but, but this energy has the, when the living entity us when we come into contact with one so we have the tendency to forget our original consciousness with this, with this. that's what it does yeah the zulus in here maya has not always been here it's something that happened from something from the Every, everything is eternal so in that sense the maya is also eternal but it's um but yeah it's like it is spiritual it is actually because everything is connected to god maya means it's not connected to God. But there's nothing that's not connected to God. But it's just we think it's not, because that's our consciousness. The Maya is also a goddess. She's so spinning this illusion for us. Yeah, it's expansion. We're asking for it, so she gives us more. Yeah, it's a learning experience. She's copying you. The service is to smack. She's got all these weapons in her hand. I'm not prescribing psychedelic drugs, but I once when I smoked DMT and she. It, everyone explains an experience, like the Tenzaketa. I just saw it as Maya's fingers weaving tapestries for me. And everyone was thinking this is the visuals they get in this medicine. And I was just seeing Maya going, Oh, you want to see some patterns, little boy? Here you go, more patterns. And show you patterns better. And it's just an illusion. And Maya's just giving you this. I saw her hands. It's like, oh, who's making these patterns? And I saw Maya. I saw like a female goddess. And then she sort of moved back. Oh, God, he spotted me. And then I came back to reality. So it's like what the whole world's perceiving as a psychedelic experience is actually just another worm of illusion. It's like a classic... No, the MT thing is actually just it. another layer of so story. It's not actually enough truth. Well, that's what they were showing me. You know? yeah, the word Maya means not this. But what it means is it's not what it appears to be. So this energy exists, but we think it's something else than it is. Or we think it has a different purpose than what it is. And the, uh, each, the purpose of everything is in relation to God. But the Maya is, we think, is in relation to us. Basically, it's for me to be oh, yeah, enjoy it, to me to like become. And that's the, the fall again, is the me, I, yeah, I yeah, am not the. Exactly. The it's gratification. And so basically, you know, Prabhupada says that, that, that um, Maya means sense gratification <laughs> and um, Krishna consciousness means service. God consciousness means service. And they back to back. So the material world, that's actually our choice. Is Maya or God consciousness? Maya or God consciousness? It's really helpful with being with addictions and stuff. Like, for me, I have a thing with joints. That's not always. Sometimes I stop smoking and then I fall, my consciousness falls, and then I stop, then I awaken again. It's been this pattern to my life. And seeing it as like. Rather than addiction, see, like I'm indulging in Maya, in selfishness, you know, and forgetting about God because of my own pain from my trauma. It's a slightly different way of looking at it, which helps rather than thinking you've got a issue. It's like, okay, I'm squandering my time because I'm wanting to just pleasure myself with this cliff. You know what I mean? It's a funny one, but then I also like extreme because what I've, God told me is like, if I want to awaken, like, what a Christ, this example, <laughs> the awakened master, or whatever, really, and then I have to abstain from everything. Instead, I can't do anything. I can't smoke. I can't drink. I can't partake in anything. Even like, because then it comes to like too much butter or something. I mean, you have lots of butter, but it's like it gets quite extreme. Uh, like that, you. that voice that tells you, you have to be really, really pure. It's like, you can do that in this. In this. It's very hard in this. It takes discipline. I guess. I'm not yeah, sure if that's like the right message because it almost seems like it's unattainable to be like completely speak clean and not touch anything your whole life. It's like it's quite hard. It's also yeah. Yeah. The, the ideas with that is more sense things, but also the Krishna says. Um, Thank you, Tony. This is referring to his material energy, this divine energy of mind, because of divine, is very difficult to overcome, but those who surrender to me can very easily pass around it. So actually, one, when you want to engage in devotional service, one is actually experiencing something of such much a higher nature, the bliss, to give up those things is very easy. Because you're replacing yeah, you something you much better, a higher taste. That's, so that's why yeah, you need to actually you follow need a particular practice, yes. because it actually gives you that and those principles schedule on the way. To on path, path. Path. Yeah. Yeah. Why, but there's principles to keep you on the path. But those principles themselves, yeah. it's not what's going to perfect you. 
but they're important to follow because they, they actually help us keep on track. Because you can all the way somewhere else. Because they confuse the mind, they make the mind dull, you can't discriminate enough. So that's why they're there. But the rich regulations are not there, you just follow. It's actually meant to serve a higher principle, which is to connect with yeah. But they, but they shouldn't be rejected, nothing good. They actually say there's a um, this book called Network Instruction. And it's very simple. And they give some advice on getting ones in the spiritual path. And there are six things which are um, detrimental to developing one's devotion. And one of those things is it's called Niyamagraha. Which is, it comes from the word Niyama and then Adraha. So Niyama means to not do. So Yoga is Yama, Niyama. Niyama means don't do. So basically, Niyama is referring to the rules, regulations in the scriptures. So, so there actually, there's two extremes there. It can, that word can be translated as to follow the rules, regulations for the sake of following them and not for the sake of spiritual advancement. That's not good for the And then the other extreme to, to, to reject them and to act whimsically. That's the other extreme. So they said both of these things are very bad. So what should, you know, what should you follow it? But you should follow it for the right reason. You should know why. Oh, it's because I want to reserve my energies to express a devotion to God. That's why, because these things, they, they reinforce the idea that I'm this body that exists separately from God. They, they, they make my mind clouded. They make me think pleasure is somewhere else. But, so, so then, so stop those things so that you can go and you just actually, uh, I'm not separate from God. Pleasure is not somewhere else, it's in me. So it was a, but that's a long thing to actually realize in the heart. Yeah. <laughs> but this is the, they call it tattva. Tattva means just that's knowledge. That is the... Yeah. Well, give the food. Mm -hmm. You can actually take a lot of the desire aspects away. Just, one of the okay, okay things to indulge in. I mean, not too much. Yeah. And there's farmers, so yeah. spend more time on making amazing things than you've got this. Yeah. 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 I've experienced that, um, feeling, that, that sensation of the birds singing, mm. <laughs> but it's interesting how um, before they start they quieten down and then it's like very quiet and then all of a sudden everything just like starts waking up. And just go a bit louder and louder and louder and then if you're actually in a conscious state while that's happening, it's like super loud. Mm. Yeah. I've been mean, having that date with the just doing a lot of personal work and then I focus into my awareness to be present and as I become present the psychiatrists and the insects just get so loud it's almost intense but like louder than ever before it's becoming so present everything just gets like the volume goes up the nature goes like a zoop in five seconds the volume goes up I'm like did everything get louder no I'm just present I'm out of fog and out of thought but it's quite intense when you drop into that like pure presence it's like very loud it's very everything's very vibrating like Oh, oh, oh. Too much. 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 Done it so much. <laughs> yeah, like I'm it. actually really enjoying the clarity, and then this this opportunity presented itself to come here last week. I started singing this, and then I've just been chanting all week. And like this, I go walking, I go walking, and I chant while I walk. You know? That's a good one. What's up? Um, and then more and more information comes, and it's like it's almost like I'm not missing it. Because I'm enjoying all the new energy that's coming into my life instead of having the same old thing. You know, I know it too well already. <laughs> I've done it so many times. What happens is you, if a trauma comes, be, be yeah. sharp. Yeah. Something comes or someone says something or something's going to come into your field to test you. And that's usually when you wobble and then you have that joint again. So just be aware of that one. Because I've stopped and started so many times.
But it's quite nice, like, I just have to stop smoking, and then I get really, like, awake. So it's kind of like my kryptonite. You won't feel the need to smoke, I promise you. I stopped smoking because of chanting. Without craving, without going crazy, without losing my mind, without like feeling like I needed. Yeah, I just can't it every day. And it was a very um, easy it's like there was a spiritual rebellious side to me like i had a lot of meetings i had a few meetings with god like, like i met god a few times or whatever my idea that it was it felt divine so it was a part of me that was like okay and and then i actually went to elohim when i was 22 and that was really like four years of sadness after that because i wanted to, i wanted to see so i just got, I just got shown and when i came back here and it was devastated to be back in the density so there's a part of me that was like okay i know what you've told me to do i know how to get awake and like i do four or five days of meditation and singing I, like i really wake up fast so like this part of me is like i know what to do but i'm not i'm not gonna do it yet it's like you, you're telling me it's just, I'm, I want to make my own choice. I want to find my own fuck up. I don't want to be completely clear and sober and be like a trust being right now. I'm enjoying the human experience. I know that I could do four or five days meditation and I'm very, very tuned in and everything works. I make money, business grows, my ceremonies go well. It's just, I know it. It's not like I'm looking for something, but it's a part of my spirit that's still rebellious. It's like, it's still someone's like, I don't want to go do everything you're telling me to do. I want my own individuality. So that's some part of that aspect. Like I know what's good for me and what makes me thrive. But a part of me still sometimes wants to, wants to test to say, can I awaken with, without following all the rules? Can I awaken my way? There's a little bit of that. Not that I'm agreeing with it. And also this part of me is like, I can't smoke. It must be pure. It's like, then they get into another thing. And then I start judging the other hippies who are smoking. And I'm again in another trap. So I've been like, my part's been more the mystic. I wanted to taste the things of life and explore everything. I really relate to the Sufi mystic walking and just the mystic, the love, the being in the love. That That's really, the stories I've read about the Sufis, the walking Sufis, the lone, lone traveling Sufis. Yeah, I really re resonate with them. It's like, I really have a lot of resonance. With it. And it is a bit about, they do lots of things. They, Maybe drink with the innkeeper and, and, and then they'll, they'll leave again. Or it's like I, I, I like, I find when I get really in my spiritual practice, I separate from a lot of the people. Like I can't actually relate to them. I feel like my vibration doesn't match. Like I went to a party the other day, I've been doing lots of meditation. I was a trance party. My energy and life was so strong. People were noticing me, and I couldn't, I couldn't hide. And I don't want their attention. People were like, oh, what's this? Is a different frequency. And people were like, it's too much attention. And it's like, then I eventually had a one sip of alcohol and then my frequency dropped and then I got left alone. <laughs> so it's like, so I'm just sharing all these things that I, you know, it's like the more I get spiritual, the more the people that are in the density and using drugs, I, I can't help them. I'm not there to, I like, in fact, Christ spoke to the hooker and everyone and so I'm trying to figure that out, you know. <laughs> just keep chanting. <laughs> I think I've got a similar we'll journey figure it out. because I think when I figured lots out already, I'm pretty happy. Maybe you're the master of trying to get it out. I'm going to ask you the spiritual intelligence is actually growing. Yeah. You kind of you've got this dabbling instinct and everything. We all do. But every time you dabble, you actually you're 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 intelligent. Yeah. 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 Yeah
will be more or less depending on what you've done in your life. So if you've done like all nonsense, you can remember it as possible. But the chance might be a little. So it's kind of like how much how seriously do you want to remember God at the time of death? So we can have that ultimate union with your food. And then people who just their whole life from the way waking up, they just add God consciousness in there. That's why they have a sadhana. So that when they die, the mind looks through the whole life. And if just there's God is just coming up everywhere because you didn't want yeah. then the chances of your mind that you want to do that is very big. Mm. That's why we have deities in the house because it's just like such a visual and such a strong presence and we engage with them, we sing to them, we offer them food. And, and then you have your, your death review, you can see them all and you're like, hey, cool, that's what I was doing. Great. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just continue doing that eternally. I think it was also the, like the, you know, connecting with God and going to sort of illa women then coming back and being like okay i come from there so i know that in my, in my heart and soul so i don't i don't feel like i'm trying to get there like i know i come from there so that's it's, it's also that also played into my whole dabbling thing a bit because i i don't feel like i'm trying to i'm going to fall and i feel like i've fallen i've, I've recognized all the archetypes on this plane like i can resonate with all of them in a way like because we all can actually yeah we've been to so it. it's not like because i see people seeking with spiritual practice to really go to god and like be back there and it's like i've just come from god like i'm here to experience and do a mission like that's what i'm trying to figure out so this is my perspective is different because i'm not trying to get there because i i've already been there and i'm part of it yes so it's, it's but it's brought a whole other kind of things open to to human experience what, what, what is it supposed to be and i think it's all god god's plan we're still realizing god's plan of this this realm, you know, with, with the potential of it, mm -hmm. it's still, yeah. Yeah. it's an infinite flowering, flowering's happening everywhere, yeah, there. Prabhupada said that mm -hmm. in the beginning of spiritual life, it's good to want to go yes. back home to Godhead, because it kind of motivates you on that path, but as you mature spiritually, mm -hmm. even that desire of wanting to go back is also selfish. But it's actually like a good selfish, because it pushes you on the right path, but it automatically gets purified at your end. And then at that stage, when you leave your body, you're like, I don't care where I go, as long as I get to remember God and serve Him. Like, you can send me to hell, I don't care. As long as I get to do service, then I come. That's all I want. That's back to the thing, back to yeah. service. That's, yeah. that's, that's all I want. Oh, that's nice. not that, and not that I want to be best service, but that's still I want. But if you really surrender to God, you're like, I'll go to you. I just want to serve you, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Serve you, I want to serve you. Learn that someone else. Be in that conscious place. Then I'm sorry, that's all I want. And that's actually then, that's the actual only real security, is one has that consciousness. Because wherever you go, then you'll always be in contact with God, you'll always be in contact with service, and there'll always be more and more services. So then you can go there, you can stay here for this It doesn't matter. Because you are in the spiritual world then. That consciousness is the spiritual world. Whether you're in the spiritual material world. By this, you know, distinction. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's amazing. That's back to yoga. Why a crunch Yeah, I find it, I must say, we spoke years ago, and we were like, talking about going, going back to God, and I was kind of like, oh, I want to go back to God, and oh, I'm going to get out of this place, and I, it, it kind of triggered me, you know, because I, I went there, and I was like, uh, you, you're supposed to be here, and then don't, there was, there was a karmic thing with saying, I want to leave you, not particularly you, but just I noticed a lot of people will practice, they, they really like despise this place, and they really want to go, and it's like, you're missing the point, you know what I mean, a little bit, I'll check that. But that's definitely shifted now. But I was noticing that. If you remember, like, talking of this place is like, oh, like, oh I just want to do my work so I can get the fuck out of here. <laughs> it's like, it may be something that didn't resonate in the way, you know what I mean? Like, that, that, that way of looking at it, like, it's, yeah. you know, and I guess that's what you were saying, just doing it to get, just doing it to get out rather than, like, really, the spiritual, it's just still part of the spiritual journey. It's not like, You'll get to spirit there. It's like this is it. You know. Yeah, you just gotta rest back into it. You can't. It's here. You just rest back into the spiritual world. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Constitution. So, you know, you're actually going to completely <laughs> surrender 100%. You have to maintain yourself. You have to, so there's a life that you have to lead. Lead, not lead, lead. So you can't just, you can't just leave. Like even Arjuna, he couldn't just go back to Godhead. No, he had to stand up and fight. No, you, you have to do, you have to engage with the material. What Brewer is saying is that you can actually, with it, you can engage with the material, everything. Everything you do, maybe not mass murder. Some people think it. I'm not so into it. I don't think you into it either. Most material stuff you can do. You can engage. So there's no fear. It's what it is. It's actually your energy which you can apply to the situation because you can actually do everything material. With, 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 without, without that detachment and or doing it for God. Mm. Mm. That's Bhakti Yoga. That's what we are talking about. Yeah. You do everything. Maybe not match, but unless you, like, you really are looking Bill Gates or something. You have to do it. Good job. Sorry, I got so it. Is it is Dharma if you want to kill all of us. That's my job. Sorry. Well, uh, part of the greater plan of Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates. It's fulfilling a big can, role, you know. You can do everything with terror. You're just torturing yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do everything with terror, but you do it with a consciousness that it, it's actually for the Supreme, and that's up to you. And then charge a little bit to off your feet. So you could, for instance, be invited to some peasant's house. Okay, we don't have peasants anymore, sorry. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, don't use that word. Okay, well, whatever. You don't use that word. And, you, and they invite you for the table and they're eating food that you normally eat and they're offering some really like homemade wine or something. And then you consciously join them rather than making them feel uncomfortable. And then, but you can wait, okay, I'm taking this thing in my body, I'm being conscious through it. It's not really what I normally do. And then that's also back to yoga in a way, isn't it? You've got to apply to the I think Jesus said something I don't know Why should I be something that I'm not? So you turn the food away? You turn the food away? Sometimes, sometimes. It depends on time, place and circumstance. But when you, when you're, if you're, you're attentive to the cells, you, these people are going to feel they're already feeling less than you. And they're offering you the best they have. Okay? And you in their space. And by turning your thing nose up to their thing, no matter how you say it, they are going to be more dispositioned and seeing you as better, as better than them and higher to God and them further from God. I'm just saying, yeah, potentially, yeah, so yes, are you doing God's work? Like, let's say, but if there's like onions and garlic and meat, I'll give it that. But, but, but generally, I don't eat that's quite a big thing I've noticed now as well, becoming yeah. aware. Even some guy, I had some ski to the car for someone, and I immediately picked up his old emotional, yeah. any but, medicine. But sometimes in a situation, like, let's say there's that, and there's some, there's a bit of a more connection with it, and you want to encourage this person's spiritual then um, you might have some concessions on some of the things, but like drinking wine, I would not like this. But like all the person's food, when he's cooked it with love for me, because he made it, he wants it for me. But then I can take it in the consciousness that this is not for me, it's for my spiritual master, and I send it to God. So then whatever negative effects doesn't speak on me. So that's my consciousness. Because I'm not there to enjoy it. I'm like a guest now, I'm going like to have a meal. So then that's just for you. And the same way when people offer you respect, that's you and that thing and they see you. Then, then you don't take it. It's not for me. They're actually giving you the power. You're just like a guest. You're just a medium. Yeah. And they're just seeing that through you. And as soon as you take it for yourself, that's when you feel heavy. But otherwise, you feel super light because you don't take it. It's not for you. So simply that food you take, it's not for me. It's for what I And then, and that way, you can be so But things like wine and stuff, I want to take it. If somebody offers me, like, they gave some onions and stuff, it's like, so I'm not going to say no. So I took it and I think, how can I use this? So we put it down. And then at some point we bought a new cast iron pan. And you can season it with onions. So we fry some onions on there like a couple of times. It's super nasty. We didn't eat it, so we engaged in service. You can also use those alcohol. You can also tap them and then leave them to the floor. Yeah. Yes, yes. Smells and things like that. So you can be smart and use it like that. So I think that's it. And also people do appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
conducive to purification and spiritual awakening, then you stick to your standards. I think it's, I think it's how you do it. Like if you're kind of looking down on the people, like oh look at you drinking, meat eating people, yeah, yeah. down there. If you see them as, as equal and say like look, um, this is my practice. I'm not, you know, if you can do it in such a way that you're not putting them down and putting yourself up, you just basically say this is who I am and do it on a, 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 a sort of level. It's a different thing, but I think a lot of people go like, oh, you know, you guys down there. I'm... Keep doing what you're doing. You lose it. was sharing a glass with some middle aged white people in Bolivia, and um, and in the fridge, his stuff was like next to meat, and he just came from Vrindavan, which is the super spiritual place. Everything is like completely absorbed in Krishna, and now he's in this place. He shared the fridge with his veggies next to Kathy. And then, but he thought, he just he said he opened it and he thought, oh, there's something so. <laughs> and that was it. And he was just like, he just tolerated it. He thought nothing of it. Even the lady was smoking. And she was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's like, it's okay, it's okay, just go. It's fine, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so you can be like that. And then you can respect that. So you're like compassionate, but also firm in your own stuff. But you're not imposing that on others. It's difficult, I've noticed. More practice and stuff, it's hard. The more you spiritually get, the more in tune. And then the judgments can sometimes come quickly when you see someone that's not. You're really in your high horse and you've been doing lots of meditation, and then someone with bad energy or angry, and you're like, like ugh. You know, whatever it is, it's so quick. And then, <coughs> I see it all the time with people that are spiritual or teachers. I, I see it in, all over. Like, no one's, I don't know anyone that's actually awake, awakened yet. I haven't met an awakened being. No one's really got it yet. So I think it's kind of open the way to do it. But, but, um, so called, like, and stuff. If they don't have other people who they see on the equal level with yourself, then, then they're very in a dangerous situation. They get stale, yeah. You need a friend to say what you're doing. Exactly, when your teacher knows and go, hey, uh, I think you said something that was a bit out of alignment, you're like, oh, no, it's the teacher, and then the teacher gets stale. So that's, what, that's what I noticed with these shamans and people like that. They're so in their game for so long that no one can actually approach them and say, hey, this is not cool. And then they get complacent and they get old and they get out of, out of date. So how do the masters, the, they open to, they open dialogues there and you can go to your teacher and say, hey, I think this is, I'm not feeling good about this. Or, well, I think all the issues, um, when is, let's say checking a master out, once you test it, just like, but you should, like, if you go to a market and you buy a knife, if you test the knife, you have to pay money. So you should also know what the knife is supposed to do. So then you know what to test it for. So similarly for a master, you should know what is the qualities you should have. What, and the scriptures have, this is what it should be like. The certain virtues at first start. Exactly, exactly. And then, um, and then you can test that. So then in the beginning, it's, it's actually, it's, it's required. You test him, and he also tests you. Are you just another guy, or are you actually saying this? And then it goes both ways. But then after some time, you have to draw your conclusion. And then, if you choose to surrender to the person, then you have to give that up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but yes. you don't give up your intelligence. Like Prabhupada says, don't surrender your intelligence, but surrender by your intelligence. Because, because that master, and it does sometimes happen, he can make a mistake before. So you also have to pick that up. So you should know what you should be telling. And if he doesn't do that, you can actually, you actually then have a duty to tell him. I think it looks like you've gone off. And he might be testing you as well, so it's good to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think Buddha and Azuna had that. Because yeah. he no, what was Buddha's um, Buddha and Azuna? I don't know. Or his, his, one of his disciples. Because Buddha at one stage said that a woman can't reach enlightenment. And his, it was actually one of his disciples that proved, like, well, why not? You know, she's, 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 she's past having children. I think the whole idea is that children can attach you too much to this world and you can't really transcend when you're that much stuck Divine in this mother. world. But he's like, well, she's had a children, she's old, why not? And then you kind of taught Buddha, you know? You, I don't think even Jesus said to his disciples, be better than me, you know? He's like, like you, I think to start off with, you have to understand, you have to be humble to learn. But I think there's a point where you kind of transcend your master, or you should, if you learn well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, try to emulate the master. 
Yeah. Why not transcend that? You know, like, the 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 or So they don't see the concept master anymore. They're beyond. It's not even there anymore. They're seeing you as spirits and God. Yeah, they're seeing you as spirits and God. But they don't see themselves as spirits. But we should see them actually it's important that we should see them as good as God. And what do you think about connecting with masters that aren't in a body? Yeah, I, yeah well, like, you know, not having a physical, like, I've, I've really looked for a lot of teachers and they're all disappointed me. So now at the stage, I'm, I'm just talking to God and making my own stairway to, to Him, you know. And, and I've kind of dropped that. I'm, I'm open to a teacher, but I'm not looking for a teacher anymore because it's just been, it's kind of taught me what not to do, all the teachers, which is maybe what they're supposed to do. But I see the masters, the Indian and the ones I've seen, you, they seem, yeah, like, maybe with the robes and the whole, that sort of whole thing, there's less chance for them to deviate. Whereas the shamans are people that are uninvolved in the normal world. They're not in that whole practice all the time. So then they have like, you know, like off time and on time. Whereas I think the people that are really devoted are like, it's their life. They're not having a holiday from, from you know, being the, that, that, that energy. They, <laughs> it's like Dalai Lama like laying on the in Hawaii or something, like getting a massage. <laughs> probably, probably is. <laughs> I got this is it, yeah. I think it's important to have uh, as a master in the, in the physical, yeah. but you can definitely yeah. connect to the masters that are not in the physical. And you can pray to them, you know, please, you know, it's probably really hard to just find out. Like, I don't know where he is, I've not met one, but I think it's important to have, you know, you can be nice to you if you think I'm ready for it. I'm connecting now with African masters, uh, pygmies, and people that have been here from the first creation, before Indians, before South Americans, before us, the first lineages. They, Aboriginals came from them. So the pygmy ancestors were very close to God, and they weren't separated before the mind split and the fall happened. They were still in the garden and connected to script. So now I've been getting them teaching me, and I can see them at the peripheral, and they're very much about quiet, all out of love and presence and honoring the nature and spirit. So this is interesting, man. Like, yeah. So it's just so funny that sometimes we think of masters as like Indian sages. And I was saying, I was arguing with Barkley, Big B Barkley, we were talking about it's like, oh, plant medicine, you can't find a way to plant medicine. It's like, it's like, no, how do you know that there's not in Africa many Buddhas or many um, awakened saints? They just didn't write books about it. They didn't care to, because it's Africa. They don't care to write scriptures. They, Africa represents embodiment. So how do we know that in Pygmy Jungle there haven't been many awakened masters who didn't call themselves masters? So that is here in the land, in this DNA, in our DNA, in Israel, they're all around us because we're on their continent. 
Well, I think they're still living in the garden, so to speak. Yeah, they are. Pray. Every day, you, every day is a prayer. You wake up in thankfulness. Like the pygmy sing the song, like the forest is good, the forest is good. They, they believe that the whole world is good. You know? um, if something bad happens, it's because they weren't awake. That's the you know, that's how they yeah. see their world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 They, they, they call Vaishnavs in Sanskrit, which literally means like the servant of God. So they just, that's what they see. And they don't store their food and plan for tomorrow. They know, like, God will provide. There's always Vaishnavs in There's never a time when this planet did not have a Vaishnav. So they're there, and they're not necessarily just one leader. So throughout time, there's always been these people on the planet. And they've been tried in this place. But I think it's quite funny that like, yeah, white people are the ones that build the, 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 the wall around the garden and keep people out. <laughs> Seriously, like, where the garden is is where the river flows. That's where the most fertile, beautiful land is. And that's the first place farmers go and build the fence and say, okay, you guys stay out. It's mine now. Where the guys are constantly kicking people out of the garden or destroying the garden. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's so much um, magic and potent teachings in Africa that's undiscovered yet, you know, because I was, people, dig me, like, it's really this big discussion about, I was talking about Iboga and plant medicine, like, there's no way in plant medicine, you have to have a master, it's like, and he's like, you got to go to the sages, oh, the sages in India, yeah, it's like, oh, what about the sages of Africa? You know what you say? Like, where are the sages of Africa? Who knows the, the awakened? Why aren't they on it? Because they've all been. Africa's one of the biggest hidden gems, you know? And I realized. They were here in South Africa years before the colonizers. Someone told me about. Indians. Yeah. Somewhere. Who's been here as a Vishnu deity that's been worshipped for generations. They can't alter all of them. They're They call Africa. It's actually. It's a Brahmin that has been climatized to the South Africa. Do you know the story about Harry the Strand Looper? Bushman, famous Bushman. One of the first, like 400 years ago, the first Bushman they found. And he was like, on the beach, they came with the ships, and he was like, Bushman, off place, little thing like this. They're like, oh, what a primitive vote. And they're like, oh, you heard about Jesus. He's like, oh, yeah, I know that Jesus, but it's not the real one. And they'd already been traveled, they already traveled in the whole world. They just saw some primitive guy in his song, but the old history has been hidden. So, like, the Vikings came 9,000 years ago, the, the Arabs came 5,000 years ago. So, just wish was just like, they're trying to educate this primitive guy. But he's like, oh, I've traveled the world, mate. Like, what are you guys trying to teach me? Like, like this is not like standing here in the talk. Like, like, like <laughs> it's just so funny. It's so magical. And, uh, yeah. And, but this, my lineage is like I'm learning from these African elders. That's my, that's my teachers. I, I just know that. So it's very weird as a white guy and I'm learning this pygmy knowledge, you know. It's, but it's great. It's, it's more. African as a black man. No? Apparently, I speak African. It's like because they were actually, I think, more good Afrikaners than the bad ones. And because obviously, they don't even talk about the bad stuff. Afrikaans! Yeah, but they were like, I mean, how much of them like actually had families with the Koisa? So many, and it wasn't uncommon. Women came in 1865. It was only men drafted from 16. No, women came in 1865. <laughs> 20 years old, women in Asia. We're and very pushed. I think a lot of them liked the, the locals more because they were more like non centered, natural, kind of. And then the ones over there with like this kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Messed up, you know, culturally conditioned. And, so they, they, they it's interesting if you study history how often history's been new and then you start believing the, the new story that's been told. Like, and they keep changing it every 300 years, you know. It's like tweaking it. Pre-1795 was a very different story to the one we still believe that's been told for the last 200 years. It's, like, it's crazy. It's all the same thing in Australia. Like, people, you ask about how, how things were before. And no one knows. Like, you have to really dig. Uh, and, and it's funny when you ask, uh, you shall be answered and knock and the door will be open a bit. The information always comes to you eventually if you look or ask.
Yeah, that's yeah, it blew my mind to see like the level of civilization that was there before white people got there. How quickly it was all destroyed and the whole story was written, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you read the African stuff, they were doing flying, selling things, they were flying. Some of the pygmies, original pygmies, were known to fly. They were forest beings who were flying. This is like a long time ago. But in the old the scriptures, the scriptures, stories of Africa, they tribes in Africa, and now there's still people that can do magic like this. Like, literally, we just don't know about it. It's so hidden. And what happened the last few hundred years with this whole thing, they were trying to take away our memory of our other lives. So we get born and it's so new, we like don't know anything. But actually, we used to have ritual, but we actually do ritual initiation and remember who we were, who we are as ancestors. That's the, that's the actual, the true African, the way they used to do it. That's why you do ritual rites of passage. You remember, oh, that's what I, I come from there, and that's who I am. Now I'm connected to my whole lineage. So this is about this whole thing with the witch hunters that they've done to sever this. All the cultures used to have this. We all used to know our souls from before we came. We used to come in here, obviously forget because that's the deal, and then do a ritual and then remember again, and then we're back in the tribe. That's rites of passage. Rites of passage is actually remembering who you are. No, and that, that used to be everywhere in this world. <laughs> And that's what they try to separate now. Now, now by four, like, like if you have memories of past life where you're seeing things that aren't dead, then I got you crazy. That's like, we don't do that. We don't do so that. that you're freaking me out or whatever. And then you very quickly learn to like just very narrow your vision and narrow uh, your way of being. Yeah, yeah, blame those Palladians, man. Palladians, the Palladians are I'm blaming them, I'm just joking. Woo, the Palladians! The <laughs> yeah, uh, just loving, discovering the magic in this costume of the day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I didn't, I didn't resonate too much with it. He got, he got hijacked towards the end. He was very full of fear. And I could hear some of his speeches. He, when he, I don't know, something happened to him. But he was... They could have made an awesome movie out of it. Spielberg, the story where it's like somebody kind of like takes him under his wing and gives him all the books to read. I, I, I think he was maybe a knowledge keeper, but this, what's happened now, even in the shamanic cultures, all the tribes, like everyone's been jeopardized. All the, all the old practices have been infiltrated, a lot of the knowledge has been forgotten, even in the, the teachers. Like the layer of our sleep is quite deep, for, even to the masters, it's quite deep sleep. So, what are you saying again? You're talking about a Chris, a Chris, a Chris, yeah. So, he is being a, a lineage of story keepers, because they don't write stuff in Africa, they, they tell it. So, he had a quite a big role in what's happened with Africa. There's been a big thing, so he could have been targeted, especially if he knows for that character it's quite hard whereas I think in India it's more protected you know what I mean in, some, in these temples and there's more spaces where it's, it's quite difficult to I think the British did a pretty good job of trying to stamp it all out or at least sort of get that war between the, the Hindus and the, and the Islams and separate everything and but you go to India now it's like were the British even there I just see India <laughs> it just looks well, so like this they, left, they left hundreds of thousands of Anglo and uh, Go on. We, we do business, you know? Uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, 10 rupees. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. No, it's pretty. We did a pretty good job here. So, of course, the Islamic kind of conquest also with the Greeks. So, you guys had a lot of people there. They had a lot of time in front of you. years of it. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. And then World War II was all about destroying the Jews and the, the Gypsies, who were very spiritual people. There were whole towns all over Europe, Gypsies and, and Jews that had a very deep spiritual part. It was destroyed. And after the war, China attacked Tibet and America attacked Vietnam, so they attacked the Buddhist sort of tradition. And then for the last 20 years, they've been attacking Islam again. You know. It seems like a, it's almost like a sort of plan or something like the battle between good and evil or whatever. I don't know. I'm saying that it's really, it's really exciting now because the amount of mistakes and what's happening, it's really, it's really, it's intense. It's still starting, but the fact that we're in this point now that we can talk about these things and we're not so programmed anymore, it's, it's amazing. And the world's starting to see the stuff. It's like it's really exciting. Yeah. It's not just us, crazy people. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you realize it's not just us, you get permission yes. to 
Yeah. Be more free and be more yourself. Because you're not the money. Yeah. 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 Yeah.